Sometimes we need to slow it down Take a look around and breathe Cause these times go by so very fast Moments never last Quiet, we still don't shout. Tell us what it's all about. Sometimes, when you feel you've had enough, living is just too tough. Just breathe. Cause you'll regret. Good evening and welcome to the Just Love Show. It is a beautiful but very muggy night here in Marin County, California. Uh, I feel a little bit like I'm in New Orleans tonight. Um, we're going to start the show off like we do every time. Um, sit back, take a deep breath, get comfortable, look around, open your heart, and take a moment just to give thanks for all that we have to be grateful for. It's, it's very easy um, as we're going through our day-to-day -day lives to forget that we live in a world of abundance. And I like to have us just take a moment and think about all the things we have to be grateful for. I'm, I'm grateful for being on the show with you tonight. I'm grateful for the wonderful guest who I'm going to introduce in a moment. I'm grateful for Sherry giving me a place to do this. <sighs> and we will start the show now. Um, before I get going uh, with uh, my guest tonight and my introduction to him, Really great thing happened. I had the first um, uh, email from one of our uh, listeners uh, who has sent a song in. And the great thing is not only is it the first listener to send a song in uh, to play uh, during the show, but where the listener came from. This listener is in Siberia. I, I, I am just smiling ear to ear at this exchange with somebody in Siberia that we've actually reached out and connected that dot in maybe one of the most remote parts of the world. I'm just, I'm blown away by that. Um, now my guest. Um, my guest is Stephen Olson. Uh, I, I don't even know where to begin with Stephen's list of accomplishments. He's president of CM Production Companies, which uh, is a documentary film house here in the Bay Area. He's also one of the founders and um, direct, he was the director of original programming for Link TV. He's done, uh, he created a, a show, which is actually where I first got to know some of his work, was on um, Global Spirit, uh, which really looked at the, just all different philosophies of humanity and how we all approach consciousness and spirituality. Uh, he did a documentary called Healing a Soldier's Heart, which was about PTSD. Um, One Through Love, which was actually the impetus for me ultimately reaching out to him, which was all about the teachings of Rumi, who is a huge influence in my life. Um, lunch with Lunch in Bokhara, uh, Sound of the Soul, uh, a portrait of the Fez Film Festival, uh, that's what um, Sound of the Soul was. Our house in Havana, which um, Stephen actually in person told me a little bit about, which was actually going with a woman who hadn't been back to Cuba um, since the revolution and what an emotional journey that was for her. Um, he's done the last images of war. Uh, I can go on and on and on, but I'll let Stephen uh, talk about uh, everything that he's done in his life, how this 
odyssey for him began. Um, but the way I got to know Stephen um, was, as I said, I was watching Global Spirit and I just loved the program. And then I watched One Through Love and more and more that feeling of wanting to connect all of these dots was just becoming so strong inside of me. And so I said, I've, I've got to reach out to uh, Stephen and um, his uh, partner who put the show together, Parisa. And I said, I got to find out where these people are at. And little did I know, they were just literally um, across the bay from me at that time in Salsalito. So I tracked them down and sent them an email and said, I got to connect with you guys. And long story short, um, I've got to know uh, both Stephen and uh, Parisa and just what a wonderful um, people they are. And again, to have Stephen on the show tonight is uh, a, a tremendous honor, and I really look forward to him sharing um, the understandings he's gained through his uh, travels and his documentary work, where he, unlike just about anyone I, I know, has really got a boots on the ground, grass, uh, grassroots look at our, our true connections and how we share so much more in common than we do um, in that then then we have a difference um and without uh further ado i will bring on steven hi steven how you doing tonight hi kip very good thanks glad to be here thank you so much for coming on tonight um i i hope uh my introduction did some some sort of justice to your amazing career and i i really do look forward to how you know where this started for you at at what age did you start realizing that this was going to be your life's calling and uh, obviously from your body of work you have devoted uh, just it's it seems like your entire life to connecting people and understanding people and understanding what it means to be human from almost every aspect and through almost every experience so wh where did that start for you well, uh, if the it is coming to understand people, I suppose it started at a, you know, a rather young age. Um, <laughs> how does that happen? You know, uh, as a child in San Francisco, I had paper routes. I collected every month for my newspapers. I was invited in people's homes. Uh, 120 customers, 120 households. And... Uh, San Francisco is a diverse city, and um, I got a first taste of things, I think, as an eight-year-old and nine-year-old. Uh, I did spend a fair amount of time uh, restoring houses in, in, in San Francisco while I was doing my undergraduate work. Um, met a lot of interesting and different people there. Really started to travel, um, I guess, when I was 19, 20, uh, like many people, I went to Europe by myself, and uh, I got as far east as Istanbul, Turkey, before my money and time ran out. Uh, but I met at that time dozens of people, slightly older than me at the time, who were going and coming back from India overland. And um, I was, of course, really impressed when I first saw Turkey and got to Asia and saw Islam for the first time in my life, and uh, those cultural differences um, made friends there. Uh, I was driving buses to India, so I was work buying parts in the old bazaar for these old buses and hanging out and meeting some uh, uh, pretty amazing Turkish people who taught me a bit about Islam. I first heard about Sufism there, um, and then would travel across Asia to India where uh, I would sell the bus and travel on my own for months at a time and uh, I would say the cultural curiosity and yearning for different ways of knowing different ways of meaning uh, different faiths different cosmologies intrigued me and I would come back to San Francisco and tell my friends and neighborhoods about about the world that I saw um, gradually I realized if I had a camera and I could take photographs, I might have more something to show as, as, as well as to describe. So I started taking still photographs, 35 millimeter. I did slideshows. Uh, I finished an undergraduate degree in 
anthropology and film, um, and then went back to Asia again, spent another year in Asia, mostly in Afghanistan and Pakistan, Nepal, and um, uh, most of my 20s, I think I was sort of alternate years in uh, abroad, mostly in Asia, back in the U.S. for nine months or a year at a time, and then kept traveling. So the cultural curiosity has been there for quite a while. Filmmaking skills, communication, you know, the question of what do you do with all this direct experience? You know, how do you, how do you receive it? How do you channel it? How do you understand it? How do you share it? All these kind of questions were coming up in my mind and um, started pursuing filmmaking uh, and, um, you know, got more and more attuned to the craft of film communications theory, uh, did a graduate degree in anthropology and communications, uh, Temple University in Philadelphia, and um, had some amazing direct experiences. I met uh, I met a real Sufi saint in Sri Lanka uh, named Baba Muhayadeen when I was uh, 20, 24 years old. Uh, he had a very strong effect on me and uh, convinced me, uh, not directly but indirectly, to move to Philadelphia where he was going to spend his next year, so um, I chose to do my graduate school work there, being close to Bawa, was his name. Uh, the same teacher, I should add, as uh, Coleman Barks, the famous Rumi translator, um, also had the grace to meet Bawa Muhayyadeen. So Coleman and I have that little link in common. Um, otherwise, it just expanded from uh, principles of anthropology, like cultural relativity, to looking at the worldviews of people, faith, philosophy. Uh, these interests all developed as my communication skills developed, and so uh, it became kind of a somewhat integrated package of learning, discovering, and somehow conveying in whatever medium I could, uh, I could afford at the time. Um, I, I think most people are, are somewhat uh, familiar with, even if maybe um, not in the right way, uh, as to what Islam is, as to what Judaism is, obviously Christianity. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about Sufism? I, I don't think everyone's totally familiar with that. And, and also how um, Rumi connects with Sufism. I, I don't think they always understand that he was uh, from the Sufi faith. Right. Well, you know, the interesting thing about Sufism is that most Sufis don't know what Sufism is. You know, it's it's a it's a mystical um, it's a mystical subset of Islam. You know, uh, there are mystical subsets of Christianity, as you know, in different orders. Uh, Sufism, however, is different in that it's expecting people to live in the world not seclude themselves from the world. Uh, it's called the path. It's called the path. It's not really a religion. It's not really a sect. It's a way. It's a path. It's a breath. It's a remembrance of God. It's a way to remember God, really, that uses certain, um, certain universal and certain Islamic uh, tools, chants, words, music, uh, and it's kind of a way of celebrating, really, the uh, the oneness that most mystics recognize as 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 the true state of of uh, of existence. But it's not really intended to be understood. Um, it's a past, and the deeper one gets into it, uh, they don't necessarily understand more. In fact, they're often, you know. Um, they often have deeper questions or are uh, are taken deeper into a non-knowing state. And uh, that sort of appealed to me because uh, graduate school was full of people who were talking about things that they claimed to know, uh, basically in the realm of knowledge transmission. And um, 
my own personal experience with them was that nothing was wide enough or big enough or deep enough to really capture my my soul and my heart. So I left that to uh, to different spiritual teachers that I've met along the path, and uh, some of those have been Sufis. One one of my um, uh, to touch on that point. One one of my uh, probably my my biggest teachers in my life has been Joseph Campbell um really when I was younger he kind of saved my sanity because I had all this information I didn't know where it came from I had this experience with the infinite which is what you're describing to a certain extent as far as this path and the more you get into the path you realize that so much of that is just accepting it's all about the journey it's all about the question not the answer and finding your way to be and how to be not not specifically a, a given philosophy and he'd always use an um, ancient Sanskrit um, saying that those who say they don't know uh, or say they do know don't and those who say they don't know do um, and I, yeah. I, I try to live that. That's a Sufi proverb also. That's a Sufi yeah. proverb also. I think it's been used in a lot of cultures uh, but I love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well that's it's, it. Nobody even calls himself a Sufi who is a Sufi. You know, it's that, it's like that. You know, the 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 art of not knowing, <laughs> or the state of not knowing, embracing the state of not knowing, and um, it's quite contrary to a lot of our more you know egocentric desires to be knowledgeable and to be uh, authoritative and in control and so on. It's sort of a it's sort of a very uh, subversive uh, approach to that type of thing. Yeah, I, I've I've gotten to a point in my life where I, you know, every day I just allow myself to embrace the unknown more and more, and and just um, really feel so blessed that we are on this infinite journey. I um, the the idea of any sort of permanence to me um, thing uh, that would somehow stop the journey or say that we have an ultimate answer seems so foreign to me now. Um, I, I, I even see science uh, moving away from the idea that they're somehow going to find an ultimate answer to anything, which has seen, it seemed absurd to me since I was uh, since I was a child. Um, what just out of curiosity, what um, religion were you brought up in, if any? Uh, yeah, I was brought up Roman Catholic. Uh, I went to Jesuit school in uh, San Francisco. Um, not a overly religious family, but uh, you know, I went through the, I went the, through the whole Catholic education structure till university. It, it was. Um, it's funny you mentioned the Jesuits. I, I was brought up uh, Zion Lutheran. Um, and I got away from religion pretty much entirely uh, a long time ago. Although I've been immersed in everything from Islam to Jehovah's Witness to Pentecostal and then um, about two years ago uh, through a, a, a hiring agency um, I started doing some work for the Jesuit Retreat Center in Los Altos um, which literally their their membership had been there for 90 years and I spent a year working with the Jesuits doing their messaging helping to um, rebrand and build, bring in a younger following and I didn't know a lot about the Jesuits at that time um, and I they actually hired me when Benedict was still Pope and all of a sudden you know here comes Francis who uh, I, I, I find a tremendous leader I don't agree with obviously everything he has to say and I don't think he probably agrees with everything he has to say but has to appeal to some parts of the Catholic uh, of, of his base at this point um, but it was a really amazing learning experience for me, um, getting to know more about the Jesuits and really how they, what what their influence had been on the uh, Catholic Church over the years, and what they brought to um, the world at large, as far as colleges, yeah. hospitals, and even in even trying to do the best they could to sometimes protect the natives in a lot of countries. Yeah, well, I hope so. In terms of the latter, uh, there are some liberal-minded Jesuits. I did have the benefit of being exposed to some liberal minds within that order, um, and this was, you know, uh, in the late '60s. So it was a time, of expansive time, and there were many Jesuits who heard a wider uh, 
a wider calling uh, of a wider humanity. And um, I guess those were the ones who really had the most to offer me because uh, I was basically already on my way out of organized religion. And, um, you know, I've since, uh, yeah, I, I, I have uh, I have both positive and not so positive things to say about uh, about the history of Roman Catholic religious orders and uh, and other organized religions that I've seen and experienced. You know the everything from the destruction of the Ayodhya uh, uh, mosque in India by Orthodox Hindus to uh, yeah. I've spent time in Israel, Palestine. Um, the organized religion comes together in a very concentrated way in Jerusalem, as anyone who's been there knows. And um, you see the the difference between religion and power and faith and belief. And uh, they're very different. They're very different processes. And and so my own personal uh, approach has been to to try to um, respect uh, all the faiths that I have encountered and consider myself one of all of them, really. Well, that's that at, at their core, um, my, my understanding of, of all these religions is they all start with one God, um, but they started using fear to control people. And what better way to control people than keep the house divided? So even within um, the individual religions, whether it's uh, Islam and the, you have the Shiites and the Sunnis or in Christianity, the Protestants versus the Catholics, they seem to have lost sight of what God is. And I even uh, I posed a question the other day, you know, I, I asked, uh, you know, just kind of out to the universe uh, in a post, you know, why does religion seek to make God so small? And it, and it seems they really do uh, God a great disservice and have for quite a long time. Um, but at the same time, I think like like you do, that there's a lot of good in all religion. Um, it's it's just when it becomes fanatical um, that that we start running into a lot of the problems that we see today. Right. Um, like, yeah. I, I, no, sorry. Go ahead. Interrupt. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I was just going nope. to ask you, um, one thing that I was, uh, you touched on uh, was growing up in San Francisco, and I was listening to um, KPFA this morning, and I can't remember the gentleman's name, but he um, has a series of teachings out on the mind-body connection, he's a neuroscientist, and he talked about how culture, uh, it's something that we don't spend a lot of time looking at, is not just shaping how we go about uh, existing with one another, but actually how it impacts our body. And I wonder if um, what your thoughts would be. Do you think you would have had the same openness and the same um, ability to reach out and want to connect with people had you not grown up in a place like San Francisco? Well, I sometimes joke that I would have had to run away and come to San Francisco if I didn't. <laughs> I did. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it was just the way the wind was blowing then, and, and I was fortunate to be here. And, um, you know, by the way, San Francisco was not a historically, you know, uh, necessarily progressive town when it came to uh, minorities in the 30s, 40s, 50s. You know, what we, it wasn't as though it was such a extraordinary place. It was just as though it was a hub that attracted people and brought people together, you know, and that of course, generated its own uh, energy and its own process, its own creative process. And I, I guess it was uh, um, good fortune, I suppose, to, uh, to not have to leave my family, say, or sever ties with my family to, to be part of something like that. And and so that w that did uh, you know allow you to embrace the world in a larger way. And obviously, I I, I like I I did have to run away to come to San Francisco. Um, what was what was your uh, first uh, film that you worked on? My first film. <laughs> well, um, let's see. I guess really the first film that I finished as a film was a portrait of a lower caste Hindu. Uh, Boatman, that is a guy who would row 
Hindu pilgrims in uh, Benares in India, one of the holy cities on the Ganges. And uh, I did a portrait of a sudra, uh, Bodwala, they're called, and um, spent about two months with him and uh, uh, interviewed him in depth, his life, his vision of uh, his deities, you know, back to the, I mean, Hinduism as a sort of polytheistic uh, religion, trying to understand his vision of his own faith and uh, his role in life, his cast. Uh, and that project I used as my master's thesis film. Um, it became a 20-minute film. Very few people have seen it other than my, you know, like a lot of thesis films, your committee sees it, and uh, not too many other people after that. Some of these early films get buried because they're so, they're so humble and technically kind of borderline, you know? I would love to see it at some point. I really would. Yeah. I think that would be a, tre a, a tremendous honor to see where uh, <clears throat> to where the journey uh, to see where your creative journey began. Now, did you always know you wanted to do just documentary? Did you ever do any feature work or anything outside the documentary realm? I did some dramatic <clears throat> work. Uh, it was on a contract for the state of uh, California Department of Education. Uh, sort of illustrating certain, quote, best practices, you know. So those were short, dramatic um, segments, and uh, I enjoyed it. But really, I think uh, my thirst for actuality, for humanity, for society, for culture, uh, was such that I, I was naturally attracted to nonfiction, both in filmmaking and what I was reading. Uh, so not exclusively, but uh, primarily documentary. It's most it's the most poetic form of nonfiction storytelling. Uh, tends to be that cumbersome, longer length that uh, challenges the storyteller to uh, keep their audience engaged. And um, I've been in love with documentary and. Also now with Global Spirit, I produce little short stories about our studio guests and weave those into the studio discussion. So it's a kind of a pairing down of a long form documentary techniques to three, four, five minute, five minute stories that attempt to create an experience of a topic, whatever topic it is we are focusing on. I, I mentioned... I'm sorry, I mentioned Global Spirit in the beginning. Um, I'd, I'd love for you to really uh, expand on it because it is such a wonderful series. Yeah, it's a series um, I started when I was at Link TV. Uh, we, we call it the first internal travel series. Um, it's an inquiry into human consciousness. And um, we, uh, we typically uh, take on, you know, some of the some of the big questions or some of the, the timeless topics uh, like um, forgiveness, uh, music and the sacred. Um, we've done a program in search of God recently with uh, Jacob Needleman, the philosopher, and Pir Zia, uh, a Sufi uh, practitioner. Um, we look at different faiths. We look at Buddhist, Buddhism, Hinduism, Jainism. Uh, we just finished a program with a Jain and a Buddhist uh, meeting around the topic of sacred ecology and uh, exploring what ecology really is. What do we mean by ecology, the study of our home, e oikos, the Greek word is the root for ecology, and it is really the coming to understand our home. Well, what do we mean by home? You know, um, we use this. We use these words uh, very um, casually. Uh, what do we mean by home? How large a concept do we understand home to be? And so, uh, anyway, each global spirit show is a sort of exploration of of a topic with wonderful, knowledgeable, authentic teachers. I would say, and our host. Hey, our, our host series 
is uh, writer, author, uh, spiritual seeker Phil Cousineau, who is uh, a dear friend Great and a wonder, a wonderful man to work with. Who's uh, himself uh, a uh, very close friend, was both of uh, Joseph Campbell and more recently uh, Houston Smith and has just uh, co-authored uh, Houston Smith's, probably Houston's last book. Uh, so Phil is wonderfully broad and uh, and deep at the same time, and a wonderful human being. It, when you were uh, mentioning ecology and, and what that really means, there's also, I think, an awakening now, and especially as you talk about uh, the message of global spirit or the vision of global spirit to be an internal travel show. Um, I think there's also the exploration now of our internal ecology, because I, I think that more and more people are waking up to not just the ecology that surrounds us is important for us to be at one with, but we have an entire universe within our own bodies. I, I think it would surprise a lot of people to know that only about 10% of your DNA when you look in the mirror is actually what we call human and all the rest of it is flora, fauna, bacteria that we have really done as much damage to our own internal technology as to our external technology. Did your guests discuss uh, any of that when you were exploring ecology at all? Oh, sure. Uh, some of that is included under the sort of umbrella uh, topic of deep ecology and uh, deep ecology basically stemming from this Norwegian philosopher Arne Nis asks you really to come to uh, redefine who you are as a person, where your boundaries really end, and questions, do they end there? As you were saying, on a molecular level, so much of what we have in, inside of us is actually not of us, but uh, passing through us. And, you know, Joanna Macy and, uh, in this case, uh, our Jane guest, Michael Tobias, both... Uh, explored most of the show is actually uh, an exploration of self what do we mean by ourselves you know who are we really and um, I think that's that was one way of approaching that question which is really a question that global spirit asks in almost every program uh, not explicitly but uh, implicitly who are we why are we here uh, what is there to be done and what is your understanding of the self? My understanding of the self, uh, I think, you know, what we come to call the self uh, is largely an, an illusion. Uh, in fact, there is no, there is no pure individuality. You know, nature does not work that way. Absolutely. Uh, it's a construct that enables us to separate ourselves from other human beings who have other selves, but there, there's very little validity for the notion of self in, in nature. Uh, there is, you know, we're not born alone, nor do we uh, raise ourselves, nor do we survive alone. So the truth is that we are embedded in a set of interrelationships and what we call ourself is actually a, a concentration of, of human energy that is uh, ultimately self uh, group supporting. And we have fractured that. We have, in these last particularly five, six decades, we've tried to make it, you know, as a nuclear family that's independent from every other family connection often. and. Uh, we see the consequences of that. You know, we try to raise children um, sometimes in very challenging situations, and I think we're really sort of guinea pigs in a way for a kind of individualistic uh, experiment, which we're in the midst of. My my um, great-grandfather was Lakota, and I, I've always felt... I didn't know that until I was 30, uh, but now when I did discover that... Um, I really felt that, you know, on a genetic level, uh, whatever, it, that that was really the source of so much of my understandings that I, I really didn't know where they came from. Um, how do you think we came to be so separate from um, 
some of the uh, cultures or some of the understandings that indigenous people had, which didn't evolve in a vacuum of ignorance, but actually, you know, you look at, uh, say, the aborigines who have been in Australia for 60,000 years, they made the same mistakes of the over-harvest and depleting their resources and realized this, this doesn't work and they learned to, to be at one again with nature and in harmony with life's process. How do you think we got so out of balance, uh, as out of balance as we are today? <laughs> oh dear. That might, be, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, that might be too big of a question for this little brain of mine. Um, you know, um, certainly people do point to, uh, to the enlightenment and the separation of the sec sacred and the secular. Um, the compartment compartmentalization of of um, of different uh, understandings, fields, ways of knowing, uh, in an attempt to quote understand, uh, we've basically uh, divided so much of life. As one realizes, when you talk to any Lakota native or any indigenous person, you sense immediately how. Abrahamic we all are, you know, uh, how paternalistic we all are. Uh, we all meaning those in those who are from uh, Europe, uh, European nations and extraction. Yeah, it, 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 it definitely seems that we um, I, 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 I've started to look at it really as um, almost the evolution of an addiction. Um, I have a friend of mine, a really brilliant guy named Brian Kinney, who uh, actually was an uh, anthropology major at Berkeley. And he and I have had some interesting conversations about uh, conspiracy. Um, he, uh, work, he works for a large, I'm not, a large media conglomerate, and I'll just leave it at that, um, and runs some, uh, some of their ranching operations. And, um, you know, he would tell me about sitting in the boardroom. He goes, if you think there's a conspiracy, he goes, you have to sit in a, a board meeting. He goes, no one can agree on anything. And I always point out to him, I don't think it starts as a conspiracy. I think it grows into one. Um, you know, if you look at war, for instance, I don't think that are the military industrial complex. People sat down around the table and said, OK, we're going to um, create this whole industry around war. I think that we started having wars, industry grew up around it, and then we got addicted to the economy that uh, it would support. And then we didn't know, we, we, you know, and you hear it all the time, you know, you look at, say, the, uh, what happened with the Gulf oil spill, the, the big uh, chant was, oh, we can't stop doing that because we'll lose jobs. And I'm, I'm always sort of stupefied when I hear people say that. We can create jobs, we can't create a new planet. But so much of that is addictive behavior. Um, where you're willing to destroy your home, your family, your own well-being just to get that fix. And, and I think it's almost an incremental, um, it was an al almost an incremental process to get us to where we are today. I don't think that there was a conscious um, objective to make this happen so much as it, it grew into, I need more, I need more, and then pretty much you're like every other junkie. Now you're going, okay, I'm all strung out. And I've now reached the point in my existence where I either have to stop doing this and get well, or I'm going to die. Well, uh, you know, I think um, armament manufacturers are in exactly that philosophical position. I, I don't know that that applies to every man as much as it does to people who are actually directly profiting from war and are in fact you know, writing the laws <laughs> that guarantee um, a succession of wars, you know, and I, I, I just think that, you know, there's, there's a, there are degrees of, you know, what Buddhists call right action um, and warfare and profiting from war is, uh, is really not considered right action in, in the Buddhist sense and in most spiritual traditions. Uh, as powerful as a an economy is that is that uh, generates, um, there are karmic consequences. I believe. Yeah, I, I was I was using war as sort of an example, and I and I and I realized that it's not um, 
every person. I, I think to most people's credit, um, or um, maybe credit is not the right word, that 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 we've we inherently want to trust our leaders that they know best. So we follow along, and unfortunately, that's been a mistake because they really shouldn't have been trusted <laughs> in many regards. They had only their they were have only um, in when you look at war petroleum. Uh, the way industry evolved, it was all about really a very small group of people uh, controlling the masses for their own personal um, enrichment. And and then we just sort of, as a collective, got swept along in this wave of greed that only, uh, you know, as we see every day, only really served them. Um, but anyway, I, where do you think, do you think that we have the potential or do you think we're on, on a path to move beyond that and, and change our destiny or do you think we'll just continue on the way we're going to extinction? <clears throat> you know what I think about that question, it's, it's such a, it's such a projection. I, 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 it's, I really can't. I really okay. can't answer. Yep. Sorry. I um... no. That's fine. That's fine. I I it, just curious. I it was um, just tr- looking at where we're at now. It seems like we're at a crossroads. We can um, choose the path of of love, or we can stay on the path of fear. In which case, um, I guess from my perspective, either way, we are serving life's process. Because life will, if we're not here, begin anew. Um, it's just a matter of whether we want to have this experience as one or suf- one of suffering, as we have been, or one of joy. Yeah, and uh, as you said, you know, the path of love. I mean, I now realize that you asked me about Jalaluddin Rumi, uh, and I didn't really respond to that question. You know, the path of love, uh, the Sufi path, is called the path of love. Uh, but the love they are talking about is a big, wide love, and it's called in Turkish "ashk," and in Persian, which was the language of Rumi, "ishk." And "ishk" is a sort of, or "ashk," uh, represents uh, what 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 we could understand as a divine love, an all-encompassing love, a love without any separation or distinction. Um, However, in, ironically and interestingly, the a lot of a lot of um, metaphors are used that tie to human romantic love. So there's a certain amount of um, certain amount of attraction to Sufi mystical poetry. Um, on one level, it's very um, quote romantic, but it is ultimately so much more than that because. There are languages that have different words for different kinds of love. Mm. <laughs> In English, we use we just use the word love, and uh, it's a beautiful word. Uh, the deeper you go into Sufi thought and Sufi mysticism, the the more you come to understand that ashk is something something larger, something more inclusive. That was my aha moment. I I walked in, it was about five years ago, and I was having my awakening and bringing all the pieces of my life's journey together. And I walked into a room, and all of a sudden I realized I I was truly in love with everyone in the room. And I realized that there's, it's absolutely crazy to think that you just have love for one being, that, that, that love extends to everything not just human beings but to all life to you know the entire cosmos to all of infinity and and that was when i really became so passionate about just staying on this path letting people know what i'd come to understand for myself and um sharing with them as many different viewpoints as possible so that they could hear a voice that would maybe have them have that same awakening because you're absolutely right it it's not about an individual being when we talk about love it's about loving everything without condition right and as some people would say you know love is can be seen as the as the connective tissue of creation itself you know uh even uh cosmologists we did a program with ryan swim uh, and uh when he was asked you know well so what is holding the universe together <laughs> um you know, uh, 
he said himself, it's the law of attraction. Uh, these laws of attraction uh, exist in the universe, and everything is in some attraction to something else, uh, however subtle the level. And, um, you know, science has been looking for, you know, the grand theory that ties it all together. And, uh, you know, has not really come up with anything distinct. And, you know, I think Global Spirit as a series is uh, is trying to explore different avenues to that unanswerable eternal question. You know, what well, is the connection? What is the cohesive mechanism of all creation? Now that we understand that we are uh, almost certainly not alone in the universe uh, in terms of life forms, you know, how do we relate? How do we connect? How is our destiny, you know, uh, connected to that of other stars, other other species? You know, uh, the Sacred Ecology show we just. Uh, we just finished and aired uh, two weeks ago. Um, it's very much about it's very much about uh, imagine having a Jain and a Buddhist. You know, the Jain basically um, told people, told our audience a great deal about how the Jain uh, animal hierarchy is seen. And uh, you know, you talk about ways of ways of thinking or worldviews. I mean. Uh, there's a wonderful example of of a non-separation between ourselves and other animal species, other life forms on a conceptual level and as you know people most are most familiar with even on a practical level where you have seen perhaps images of Jane so careful not to step on insects or breathe in insects uh, it's a remembrance it's a practice you know and um, remembering remembering truths um, is uh, is largely what ritual is about in, in religious faiths. I had a, I had a tremendous experience with um, ritual about was about uh, a m month and a half ago. Um, as I mentioned my great-grandfather was Lakota and I've been very active in um, a lot of the uh, trials and movements of the uh, Native Americans here and some of the struggles that they've been going through, one of which was uh, I, I helped with a protest down at uh, Segorate, which is Glen Cove over in Vallejo, which was a very old burial site for the Pashtun, Ohlone, Miwoks, and they even buried the Chinese there um, before they were allowed to be buried in um, white cemeteries and they were going to turn into a waterfront park even though they'd already taken 1500 bodies out and or the remains and put them up at mm -hmm. the Hearst building and I made friends with uh, one of the elders named Wounded Knee and he was gracious enough to invite me to a sweat, uh, Lakota sweat uh, up in Novato and I I had no idea what I was getting in for. It, it was such a moving experience to have 40 people for three hours uh, packed in this hut and just the, it was so much more involved I, I i i was thinking okay i'm gonna go up there and sweat and we're going to do some chants and stuff and i had no idea the ritual behind it, and it was really really intense it, it's so important that you do experience ritual because like you said it, it connects you to ancient truths and you understand um you know you start to have a better understanding of how how we evolved um as a species yeah, it's the experience of it rather than the thinking about it, you know, or the recitation or a scripture-based uh, a, a scripture based connection to the truth. It's a, it's a lived, breathed, experienced connection, and it's of a different order, has a different impact on the, on the, the being, on the human being. Um, what was, um, sort of change topic a little bit, what was your... Uh, what's what's been your favorite film that you've worked on? What was the most moving experience you've had in your career while you're making one of your documentaries? Uh, most moving experience I've had while working on a film, I guess, you know, I'd have to say was uh, perhaps the film I did in Afghanistan called Last Images of War, where I was almost killed on two occasions making that film and survived 
through some kind of stroke of luck and good fortune. Um, uh, but I think um, the films that mean the most to me in general are the films that feel like they are wanting to be made and that the timing and the myself involved or my uh, the subject matter is all right and aligned and it, it, it just feels like um, a story wants to be told and that Afghan film called Last Images of War was about four photojournalists who were killed during the Afghan Soviet war um, one of them was a friend of mine uh, and it follows their stories their motivation to cover that war as journalists uh, their relationships with Afghans and uh you know their 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 subsequent demise and um the reflections of their family families on on uh what it all meant that we we discussed a little bit uh this morning as one of the uh subjects we might want to touch on and this leads nicely into it is the state of um journalism media in this country um i know <clears throat> i mentioned kpfa which is doing some truly uh, heroic um, reporting on on everything from the Ukraine to what's going on in Gaza <clears throat> and giving a much more um, rounded view of of the situations both in both places. Um, and then on uh, Link TV, I, I was exposed to people like Greg Palast, who I, I'd never even really had, uh, I'd never heard of his work before, uh, who's a truly uh, just courageous uh, investigative journalist, uh, you know, Richard Wolf, who you, you don't hear a lot of places other than Link TV or uh, radio stations like KPFA. Um, do you, are you seeing a return to some more um, authentic journalism in this country? And, and sort of, because I'm getting the feeling that there's a lot of journalists who are going, you know, I need to get back to doing the job that I wanted to do. Yeah, um, well, a return to authentic journalism, that's an interesting way of framing it. Um, I think journalism has, 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 uh, has, has suffered in recent years, obviously, through um, corporate control of media outlets. And it's well known that, you know, um, investigative reporting... Uh, at least until the last few years when a few foundations have really up to their support for uh, investigative journalism and organizations like CIR, Center for Investigative Reporting, and uh, you find that there is a bit of a, um, of a kind of a, a, a new fever around what we could lose and the, the role of investigative journalism, the necessary role of investigative journalism in our society. So. Um, one hopes that with the decentralization of um, outlets that investigative journalists will, uh, will find their audience and that the public will take it upon themselves to sidestep uh, media conglomerates and find different truths expressed through different, um, different news outlets, both on online and broadcast. Could you could you tell people a little bit um, as we're coming down the end of the show here a little bit how Link TV came to be and what separates it from say other public broadcasting like uh, NPR? Well, uh, or you mean PBS? Or PBS, yeah. I'm, I apologize. Yeah. Um, so, Link TV was formed in December of 1999 by uh, about ten of us, uh, mostly producers of current affairs programming and cultural programming who had spent time outside the U.S. and were actually familiar with other broadcast systems, uh, European and Asian, African, and so on. And there was a moment when the satellite frequencies were being basically given away to um, two main providers, where those providers were, were asked to provide 12 channels in the case of uh, DirecTV, and I think it's eight channels in the case of Dish Network, uh, for real public interest uh, to nonprofit broadcasters. And of course, nonprofit broadcasters included religious broadcasters, and 
of the, I think, 11 free channels that were to be given to nonprofit organizations on DirecTV. Uh, Ten of them went to religious broadcasters who technically fit the requirement of being nonprofit. And Link TV received the 11th uh, on Direct TV network and uh, was initially supported by the Ford Foundation, MacArthur Foundation, the Knight Foundation. Um, six months after Link TV was launched, um, no, about about a year after Link TV was launched, uh, 9/11 took place, and there was a huge question about as you may recall, um, what did the United States do to deserve this? And who are these people anyway? And shouldn't we find out more about these, you know, this new enemy? And uh, so Link TV was, was uh, launched as, as a, the head of original programming. My job was to create a couple of signature uh, series for Link TV um, that would distinguish it and provide a unique service. And, uh, of those, the one that really stuck, I guess, was uh, a program called Mosaic, World News from the Middle East, presenting different Middle Eastern broadcasters' views on um, regional events, uh, national, and uh, and then, of course, culture, cultural programming, world music, um, thoughtful, uh, thoughtful speeches by uh, progressives, you might say, uh, a bit more left of center than most PBS stations. Um, we were catered more toward, mostly towards what were called cultural creatives. Uh, initially, people who had international interests, uh, largely uh, educated crowd initially. But then the funny thing happened was that, you know, immigrants found us. And all of a sudden, 35% of our audience were first generation immigrants who themselves, as you can imagine, brought some global perspective, had some global point of view or perspective in their lives, um, had some sense of another way of thinking, another system. And uh, Link also morphed between, uh, morphed from being a mostly rural-based satellite service to being about 50-50, 50% rural, 50% urban, uh, non-commercial, supported by foundations and viewers. And uh, I think it, you know, uh, Link TV is still going. It's uh, on Direct TV, nine, uh, what is it, Channel 375, and um, encourage people to watch it. It's it's brilliant. Unfortunately, I have uh, Comcast now, and I, I don't get to see it, which really upsets me sometimes. <laughs> Unbundle your system, Kip, just like I tell everybody else. Most people have Comcast by default because they're just playing a convenience game with their internet and television service and phone. But if you decouple those, you can actually make your own independent choices uh, and uh, enjoy them. I think that's what I'm going to definitely have to do. I, I, switched, I switched over to Comcast. Convenience shopping, you know. Yeah. yeah, definitely definitely convenience is a, is a problem with our species. So if, <laughs> if people want who don't, who are on Comcast, or don't have cable at all, where can they uh, find Global Spirit? Is there other oh. uh, outlets? Go to our website, globalspirit.tv, and you can find uh, several segments from all of the programs we've done, um, three to six, seven-minute segments featuring all of our guests, some of the highlights from every program, and uh, complete programs are available there. Uh, globalspirit.tv and if you want to see any of the other programming that I've been talking about you can go to CEM's website that is cemproductions.org and uh, there you'll see the One Through Love project uh, which is the Rumi project <clears throat> uh, you'll see Global Spirit you'll see the Healing a Soldier's Heart the PTSD film so much is there online for people well, Stephen, I want to thank you so much for being here with me tonight. And before we play the song out, uh, if you could stay for just a moment, I'd like to talk to you after the song. Um, but we're going to end the show tonight with Firebird. And this is from 
Nina Goncharova in Siberia. And Nina, if you're listening, thank you so much for sending the song in. Next week, I will have Lena Wilder on to talk about her upcoming photographic exhibit called Origins and Destinations, which is all about um, our connecting through airport hubs, basically, and the, and the essence of ourselves we leave behind as we move through. <laughs> Fly with mysterious wings I live in the depths Of unbounded soul dear The place where happiness The place where happiness Blossoms silently here I am your dream And you star human being I am calling you To follow the sun Love. 